Good morning, OTC Shabbat Shalom. Our scripture reading for this morning is 2 Samuel 14, verses 1 through 33. Now Joab, the son of Zeruah, perceived that the king's heart was drawn toward Absalom. So Joab sent a messenger to Tekoa and brought a wise woman from there and say to her, please follow morning rites and put on morning garments now and do not anoint yourself with oil, but be like a woman who has been mourning for the dead for many days. Then go to the king and speak to him in this way. So Joab put the words in her mouth. Now when the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and prostrated herself and said, Help, O king. And the king said to her, What is troubling you? And she answered, Truly I am a widow, for my husband is dead. And your servant had two sons, but the two of them fought in the field, and there was no one to save them from each other. So one struck the other and killed him. Now behold, the entire family has risen against your servant, and they have said, Hand over the one who struck his brother, so that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he, had, he killed, and eliminate the heir as well. So they will extinguish my coal which is left, so as to say, Leave my husband neither name nor remnant on the face of the earth. Then the king said to the woman, Go to your home, and I will issue orders concerning you. The woman of Tekoa said to the king, My lord, the king, the guilt is on me and my father's house, but the king and his throne are guiltless. So the king said, Whoever speaks to you, bring him to me, and he will not touch you any more. Then she said, May the king please remember the Lord your God so that the avenger of blood will not continue to destroy. Otherwise, they will destroy my son. And he said, as the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. The woman said, please let your servant speak a word to my lord, the king. And he said, speak. The woman said, why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? For in speaking this word, the king is like one who is guilty, in that the king does not bring back his banished one. For we will surely die and are like spilled water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up. Yet God does not take away life, but makes plans so that the banished one will not be cast out from him. Now then, the reason I have come to speak this word to my Lord, the king, is that the people have made me afraid. So your servant said, let me now speak to the king. Perhaps the king will perform the request of his slave. For the king will listen to save his slave from the hand of the man who would eliminate both me and my son from the inheritance of God. Then your servant said, please let the word of my Lord, the king, be comforting. For as the angel of God, so is my Lord, the king, to discern good and evil. And may the Lord, your God, be with you. Then the king answered and said to the woman, please do not hide anything from me that I am about to ask you. And the woman said, let my lord the king please speak. So the king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all of this? And the woman replied, As your soul lives, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right or to the left from anything that my lord the king has spoken. Indeed, it was your servant Joab who commanded me, and it was he who put all these words in the mouth of your servant. 
In order to change the appearance of things, your servant Joab has done this thing. But my Lord is wise, like the wisdom of the angel of God, to know all that is on the earth. Then the king said to Joab, Behold now, I will certainly do this thing. Go then, bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell on his face to the ground, prostrated himself, and blessed the king. Then Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord the king, and that the king has performed the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. However, the king said, He shall return to his own house, but he shall not see my face. So Absalom returned to his house and did not see the king's face. Now in all Israel, there was no one as handsome as Absalom, so highly praised. From the sole of his foot to the top of his head, there was no impairment in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, and it was at the end of every year that he cut it, because it was heavy on him, so he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels, by the king's weight. And to Absalom, there were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of beautiful appearance. And Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem, yet he did not see the king's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but he would not come to him. So he sent word again a second time, but he would not come. Therefore he said to his servants, See, Joab's plot is next to mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. So Absalom's servant set the plot on fire. Then Joab got up, came to Absalom at his house, and said to him, Why have your servants set my plot on fire? Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I sent for you, saying, Come here, so that I may send you to the king to say, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me still to be there. Now then, let me see the king's face, and if there is guilt in me, he can have me executed. So when Joab came to the king and told him, he summoned Absalom. Then Absalom came to the king and prostrated himself with his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. Thank you, Michelle. All right, nice little chapter there for us to open up and, and delve in. What a blessing it is to have the opportunity to spend the time saturating in God's word, marinating throughout the week so that we can talk about it together today. So maybe I'll start with a, a slide or two, a picture. Oh, whoops, I've got to switch this the other way. I'm calling this sermon Seeking Wisdom, Finding Reconciliation. We're looking at wisdom and reconciliation in this chapter. Uh, when I think of Absalom and David, there's a lot to think about, but I guess what comes to my mind is Rembrandt, uh, which should not be a surprise. Uh, my favorite artist growing up, Rembrandt, this is a painting which uh, it's debatable among many art scholars who this actually represents. Some people think, is this Jonathan and David? Uh, there is, uh, you know, there's a lot to look at in this painting, but uh, I like to see it and think of it as David and Absalom embracing and I think what we see in this painting and a little bit in this chapter, of course, is what looks a little bit like an uneasy embrace. Later on, we'll zoom in to kind of understand how is, how is David's uh, expression in all this. This is, like I said, an uneasy embrace between a father and, and a son. The question, though, is, is it really love? Is it really reconciliation? Because here in this chapter, we see a lot about wisdom. It comes up in key points. Uh, the 
question is, is it really wisdom? We also see a lot in this chapter about uh, allusions to God. There's a lot of references to God, but are those allusions really telling us what God wants to tell us? And here in this chapter, as we mentioned, we see rec uh, reconciliation, an effort at reconciliation, but is it really truly restoration? I think that's the questions I come away with as I look at this text. And once again, as we see the life of David, not everything is as it appears. David, as we know, has left a broken family in the wake of his sin, and he needs to receive wisdom. He needs to find restoration, but will he? Uh, and I guess the question I have for us is, are we seeking true wisdom? Or what's the alternative? Will we find real and lasting reconciliation in the wake of our sin? Or is it something else? So before we uh, get into this chapter, I want to just recap. It's been a couple of weeks since we looked at chapter 13. Let's remember what happened there. Division in David's house. The beginning of his family troubles. Remember Amnon, David's oldest, fell in love, so to speak, with Tamar, raped her. That was Absalom's sister. And then, of course, we see David's inaction, right? His, his lack of administering justice, which led to Absalom deciding, I need to take vengeance. But he waited two full years, and then he avenged his sister, and he killed Amnon. After that, Absalom fled to Geshur. We heard about Geshur, and here it is on the map as a reminder. As you'll see, Jerusalem is the, the bottom of the arrow, and way up by the Sea of Galilee, to the uh, east of the Sea of Galilee region, is the region of Geshur. It's not exactly outside of David's range, but uh, it's, it's just kind of far enough, right? For David, it's, I guess, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and that's where Absalom has been for three years as we begin uh, chapter 14. I think in, in this chapter, we kind of see two major movements, pretty easy to detect. The first one is the woman, uh, the wise woman from Tekoa, bringing this message, or at least trying to bring a message about wisdom and about mercy of a sort. And then the latter half of the chapter, verses 21 through 33, reconciliation. Again, is it reconciliation? Uh, so it's an amazing text to me. Uh, we kind of have to navigate it a little bit so we can understand what we need to learn from it. But before we do that, let's pray and ask God to open our hearts and our eyes. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for your being active in history and among our people and revealing yourself, Lord, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Lord, revealing yourself to Moses, revealing yourself to David. And Lord, confronting them with our sin and your holiness, Lord, and what has to happen as a result of that, God. And so as we read through this chapter and we see the, the outcome of, of David's sin and the, the crises in his own family, Lord, help us to learn from you what we need to do uh, to turn back to you, God, through your word. Uh, open our eyes, open our hearts, and uh, help us to, uh, by your spirit, to take the steps we need uh, to walk in faith. Lord, I pray in Yeshua's name. And give me wisdom as I, as I walk us through this passage. Amen. Amen. So first of all, let's start with the first passage, the first movement of the chapter. You might call it the first act because there is some acting going on in this chapter. Before we do, looking back at the last part of chapter uh, 13, if you have your Bibles open, Remember in verse 37, Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, the king of Geshur, and David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom had fled and gone to Geshur and was there three years. These, these years come in, into play. And then it says, the heart of King David longed to go out to Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon since he was dead. Now last time we spoke, we, we asked, is that really the best translation? Because sometimes when you translate a text, it can kind of affect how you interpret the text. Uh, because other translators have taken those same Hebrew words to say not so much that David longed to go to his son in sort of a, oh, I just love to be with him. But the terminology in Hebrew is 
normally used to go out to battle against someone. So another interpretation put it this way, David, the king, longed intensely to march out against Absalom, for he was grieved about Amnon that he was dead. So, you know, otherwise you're trying to figure out what is David's feelings about Absalom? I think they're pretty conflicted, and I think that you can see that throughout this chapter, not to mention going forward. But then we get to the beginning, and Joab, the son of Zeruiah, perceived, the Hebrew is to know, yada, that the king's heart was inclined toward Absalom. The Hebrew word there is also, uh, can be translated that his, his, his heart was on or concerned with Absalom, but also that word could be translated against. So one way or another, David is thinking about Absalom, and it might not be for the best uh, reasons. So in light of this knowledge, Joab decides, you know what, I think I better intervene here. Uh, and so he, he designs this, this grand pretense. He sends to Tekoa. Let's look at that map again. Uh, whoops, I'll go back the other way. You'll see that Geshur is way up to the north, but just a few miles, about 10 miles south of Jerusalem is Tekoa. It's the, I guess I could use the little thing here. So there's Jerusalem, here's Tekoa, just below Bethlehem. And Tekoa is a city right on the border between sort of the pasture lands and the Judean desert, kind of right there. Um, but it's known for its shepherds, and uh, the prophet Amos came from Tekoa. Uh, I'm not sure why Joab sent to Tekoa, but he decided I need to find a wise woman. Maybe there was like a, a wise woman school down in Tekoa, and he just, give me your best and brightest, because I, I have a big job here for her. Uh, and he brings her to Jerusalem to play this role. Now my question as I'm going into this chapter is, what is Joab trying to do? What are, what are his motivations? Because, uh, and does it come out? Can you even tell? Um, because for some reason, he's orchestrating all of these things to try to impact David. And so the question is, is it because he's just got a soft spot for Absalom? Well, again, if you keep reading, he doesn't have such a soft spot for Absalom. So what is it? Is he just a sentimental guy? You know, he just can't stand to see a father and a son unhappy. So he really wants to get them together. Well, I think if Joab can be described as anything, it's not sentimental, right? He's usually thinking more politically and militarily, so we have to kind of wonder what is it he's trying to achieve. I'm not going to answer that right now, but maybe as we get through his uh, plan and this message of the woman, we might be able to understand not only what his motives are, but what is God trying to tell us through all of this. So here again, we see Tekoa, the woman who came from Tekoa. Starting uh, in verses 2 and 3. So Joab sent to Tekoa and brought a wise woman from there and said to her, Please pretend to be a mourner and put on mourning garments now and do not anoint yourself with oil, but be like a woman who has been mourning for the dead many days. Then go to the king and speak to him in this manner. And instead of getting the speech itself, it just tells us Joab put the words in her mouth. Uh, so yes, he obviously gave her some words, but... I don't think she's just memorizing from, from you know, wrote uh, this speech. But obviously he chose her because she's well-skilled in the art of extemporaneous speech and debate, right? Like some of our young people. Uh, maybe that's the school she went to. <laughs> Why? Because he needed somebody who could engage in a conversation, actually in a game of wits, with King David. And you don't just send anybody to do that with King David. So it's important for us to remember, because sometimes she's so convincing, we think, boy, she really has this problem. But no, it's an act, right? It's, it's, uh, it's a disguise. She's supposed to go and uh, pretend that her, her husband's dead, that her uh, one son murdered the other son. Uh, it's a play within a play. And I love even at the beginning here, for maximum effect, Joab is using language which reminds us of some of the what David had recently experienced. Remember what we read at the end of uh, chapter 30, uh, sorry, 13, in verse 37. David mourned for his son every day. The Hebrew is kol hayamim, every day. Uh, well, that is echoed here when he tells her that he wants her to look like she's been mourning for her dead son many days. Yamim rabim. Not a direct quote, but an but a echo of that. Uh, they're both connected to the word aval, which is the word to mourn. And so David wants to start of, uh, uh, sorry, Joab wants David to be drawn in by this case 
that she's presenting. And so in verses 4 through 7, she presents the case, right? Which you could call the act, as she goes before David and shares this story with him. Uh, She begins by doing what? She falls on her face to the ground, right? So that's the way you approach the king. That's the right formality. You, You fall to your face on the ground, which is interesting. We see that happen three times throughout this chapter by the three major players in this room. And she cries out to David, Hoshia, save us, save me, O king. Hoshia means save, which we get from that word Hoshiana, Hosanna. That's what you say when you have a case and you need to be delivered. And the, she comes to David, right? He's the, the king, but he's also the supreme judge of Israel. And this is a case that only he can solve. And then she proceeds to unfold her story of her bereavement. Her husband's dead. Her sons have fought with each other. One is dead. And if that's not bad enough, the other relatives want me to give them the murderer so they can have vengeance. Not to mention they want the inheritance. It's like it's, it's, it's the perfect storm in her life. And it's the fact that the son is her only remaining son, right? He's the heir. She calls him my my coal, right? That last burning ember of my life. Also, he's my husband's inheritance and and name. So those are important issues for the people of Israel, right? Name and inheritance. But also uh, this scenario must sound very familiar. I don't know how quickly David's going to get this, but, you know, two sons, one killed the other. Uh, one is, you know, being wanted for this crime. And so this, this should remind David of his own sons. Anyway, that's her story, and she's sticking to it. Uh, but now, so begins the dialogue. This is the part that she's well trained in because he's going to start shooting back, and she has to engage with David. But she's kind of leading him, right? It's, a, I don't want to be kind of mean, but it is a little bit of a, a trap that she wants to get him into, get him to the place uh, where he'll make certain commitments. And so they begin. And David is led step by step by step. There's these three steps, so to speak, into this trap that she, through Joab's instructions, has set for him. What are those steps? We see in verse 8, his response to her case. Then the king said to the woman, go to your house and I will give orders concerning you. Okay, that's nice. She's going to say, okay, uh, I'll take care of business, you know, whatever the problem is. But uh, as we see then in verse, the next step, verses 9 and 10, the woman's response is that, you know, I could use a little bit more uh, something concrete, a little more assurances uh, for my my family, not just like general orders because, uh, you know, just writing a strictly um, worded letter is not going to really change things. So um, she, she says, don't worry, the guilt will be on me and on my family, not on you. In other words, not on the kingdom or on the throne. This is a lot like when Abigail came before David, right, to intercede before he destroyed all of their people and said, look, it's the guilt be on me, she said in 1 Samuel chapter 25, not on you. So I think he hears this and he's satisfied that if he were to do more for her, you know, because of this statement, he won't be dragged into the family feud. So instead, he makes a promise that he will, by all means, protect her. Now, great, but she comes back again. That's not quite what I'm asking for, she says in verse 11, because it's not just about me. I'm talking about my son, I'm talking about the heir, right? What about him? <laughs> and so he's the one who needs not only to be uh, forgiven, but reinstated and protected. So she asks him for the strongest guarantee she could get, which is a vow in the name of the Lord. Will you swear to the Lord? And that's, a, that's, that's an important, that's a big thing for David. And David at this point, you know, is drawn and he's like, yes, I swear, I'll swear a vow in the name of the Lord with everything in my power that nothing, no harm will befall your son. Not just you, not just generally, but I'll protect this son. Well, now she's got him right where she wants him. Okay, this was a kind of an effort to get him to that point and kind of snap the trap on him, so to speak. Uh, And so here we get in verses 12 to 14 kind of the heart of the scene and the heart of her her ploy. And these are probably the words that Joab says, whatever you do, don't forget to say this part to the king. And so, you know, she got what she wanted. He makes this promise. And it's as if she's turned into go. But you ever see Columbo, the old detective show? 
he stops and he's like, uh, one more thing. You know, he's got his cigar and he's asking, and it's really the thing. He acts like it's just another little point, but it's the thing. <laughs> and like Columbo, boom, you know, she hits him with the, with a, the bold and direct uh, speech. With a, with a proverb thrown in here and there to remind him that she's, you know, gone to the best wisdom school out there. But she daringly accuses the king at this point of doing what? Of being a hypocrite for calling on the name of the Lord in order to restore this woman's son, but not recalling his own banished son. Now, look, she's bold, but she's not that bold. She couches her statement in a lot of protective layers, right? She, she sort of hides behind the people. How could the king do this in verse 12? I'm sorry, verse uh, 13. Why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? So she's not just saying it's about me, but the people that you are responsible for. But then she also points out and she says, the king is as one who is guilty. Now she doesn't say you're guilty. She says, you're just like somebody who's guilty. You know, she's very careful not to be too, uh, you know, offensive, but at the same time kind of pushing it a little bit. Uh, you're like one who's guilty. But lastly, she also applies to the survival of Israel, the Jewish nation, because Israel would surely die under the cir certain, these current circumstances. And she uses the phrase to surely die, which we've heard of before, right? In Genesis chapter 3, uh, you will surely die. In chapter 12, of 2 Samuel, where David's son was told he would surely die. Mot namut is the Hebrew, kind of a double emphatic certain death. Like water poured out on the ground, it's going to seep into the soil. That's our lot. If you don't bring back this son of yours, who's the heir, who, you know, what will happen to the kingdom? Again, she's, not, she's careful not to name him for some reason. She doesn't say him by name, or maybe you know, he'd flare up in anger, but the banished one. And here she concludes uh, in verse 14 with this poem of sorts, right? Uh, let's read that again. The second half of verse 14. Yet God does not take away life, but plans ways so that the banished one will not be cast out from him. I think now she's really tugging at David's heart. This might be kind of, this might be not so much what Joab told her to say, but she's like, oh, I got a good one here. <laughs> because remember, God's defining feature isn't necessarily his retribution, right, but his forgiveness. Uh, as we've read over and over again in Exodus chapter 34, God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And we know, and David knows this, right, because he himself has been the recipient of God's forgiveness. So he's being kind of challenged here. How could you not extend that kind of forgiveness to others? Well, this is kind of the end of her bold speech. Now she kind of pulls out her soft brushes. Okay, so in art, when you, when you paint with bold strokes, then you sometimes get out a little fan brush and you soften the edges. You try to make it not quite too, too uh, you know, shocking. So she gets out her soft brush again in the next couple verses, 15 to 17, to kind of soften the message again. Uh, and she says, now the reason I've come to speak to my Lord the King is that the people, probably the, the family, the relatives, have made me afraid. So your maidservant said, let me now speak to the King. Perhaps the King will perform the request of his maidservant. So she's going back now to her, her pretense, her story, and uh, her, also some of her fawning, right, as she lays on uh, more and more of the, the flattery. But she reminds him how upright and just his decision was on her behalf, on the one hand, right, she sums up in verse 16 the reason she came and presented her own case. And on the other hand, verse 17, she sums up, uh, again, with more and more flattery thrown in, the reasons David should act justly in the case of Absalom. Again, she doesn't name him explicitly, but she, I like how she kind of pours on that really, that last uh, little bit. Uh, in, at the end of verse 17, so is my Lord the King to discern. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I missed it. Go back a little bit. Where she says, like an angel of God discerning good and evil. I guess I was right there. Uh, I mean, she's kind of like taking him by the cheek and saying, oh, you're such a good boy, you know, really just buttering him up here. 
And uh, it's interesting, she does mention God in her speech seven times. Um, not that the number seven I, necessarily is, is mystical or anything, but that, that she has repeatedly appealed and referenced God in her effort to kind of get David's attention. Um, but at this point, I think David sort of sees through, like, hey, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> so by verse 18, he sees right through the scheme, right through the masquerade, and he sees Joab at the heart of it. And I love now, as we go forward in this, how he kind of switches seats a little bit with the woman, right? She came to him and said, please hear my case. And he said, go ahead and speak. And now uh, he asks her, can I ask you a question? And I love how she kind of takes his role and says, go ahead, speak. You know, I mean, again, very gently, let my lord the king please speak. But nevertheless, now she's, that's kind of a funny role reversal here. And uh, of course, he, he discovers it's Joab, isn't it? I could tell. And then again, she just says, there's no fooling David. She pours on just how, how wonderful and wise and brilliant he is. Um, but it's, yes, it is Joab. It's all his ruse. It was intended to kind of wake up the king uh, to the importance of bringing back his son, his banished son. I love how it says that these words were intended to change the appearance of things. That's why Joab did these things which is kind of like another translator put it this way, uh, to offer David another perspective on the matter, okay? Like to change the way things looked. Because what, what, what did things look like before? Well, I, he had probably two options. I could go out and fight against my son, or I could just leave him and just fume, and there would be no resolution. So Joab's like, well, let's, let's try something else. Let's get him home. You know, I don't know what that other perspective is that Joab had in mind, what his goal is. Let's come back to that question. Because we ruled out the idea that he's just a big softy. Uh, so what is it? Is it to bring peace to the throne? You know, because uh, David's full of inner tor- turmoil and let's keep the kingdom running smoothly. Let's kind of take care of this unfinished business. Or is it his idea to quote the old maxim, uh, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer, right? Because uh, you've got an angry vengeful Absalom who's living far away where he might be able to gather strength for himself but outside of your your purview uh, that's more dangerous than having him close at hand where you can keep a watch on him Um, or is it maybe he maybe it's not that easy to keep watch on him Uh, you know so what are our question uh, our question I guess is what are our motives as we also try to relate to the people around us, whether we draw them close or whether we push them away. You know, is it for selfless reasons or is it for selfish reasons? Um, Don't know entirely the answer to that in the case of Joab. The question is, will it work? Will his scheme work? Can he get Absalom back into the court? Uh, Because you know what? David is not always stable. He, He changes his mind. And he doesn't know or take into consideration what is Absalom scheming on his own. Things might not turn out the way Joab wants them to happen. Now, I think it's interesting here at this point, before we move on to Act 2, to ask uh, some questions about what the text is telling us, okay? Not just what it's telling David or telling Joab or telling this woman, but what about us? And what about God speaking to us today? And again, as we mentioned at the beginning, this passage seems to celebrate wisdom as it brings in this wise woman. Uh, But is this really wisdom? It brings up God, but is it really the message God wants, the message that we need? Let's talk about wisdom, right? These first 20 verses, they kind of open and close with the idea of being wise. We have the woman who is wise in verse 2, and in verse 20, David is called wise and has given wisdom. But we also have the word to know, that idea of knowledge. At the beginning, Joab knew that David had this issue. And by the end, in verse 20, it's David who has knowledge, who knows uh, things. So wisdom and knowledge, right? Kind of bracketing this passage. But again, it's true wisdom. Uh, In the movie Lord of the Rings, do you remember Frodo was uh, trying, was being confronted by uh, Boromir. Boromir had his own agenda, and he was telling him, I've got an idea. Let's all help you carry the ring, right? And, and, and Frodo says, it would seem like wisdom, but for the warning in my heart. And so when I look at this passage, I feel like it's talking about wisdom, but there's something in my heart that's telling me, is this really wisdom? Remember Jonadab in the last chapter, 
who advised Amnon and later advised King David. He was called a wise man, and uh, his wisdom, of course, assisted Amnon in getting Tamar to come into his room. So there is a certain kind of wisdom if it's skill. You know, the woman here is skilled in elocution and disputation, and to the world, that's a certain kind of wisdom. But is that God's idea of wisdom that David needs at this time that we need? So in our lives, when we're facing conflicts, which, uh, raise your hand if you've never faced a conflict, <laughs> all right? Uh, okay, you can put them down. And, uh, you know, how do we bring, what, what are our efforts to try to bring some resolution, to bring equilibrium to those conflicts? What's the wisdom we look for and what's the wisdom we apply to our lives? Is it our own wisdom? Is it somebody else's wisdom? You know, when I apply my own wisdom, the result usually leads to more and worse problems, right? Like if I had a, a leaky pipe under the sink and I thought, oh, I'll take care of it. I'll just get this duct tape. I'll put it around there, you know. And for a moment, it looks like the leak has stopped. But very soon, there's going to be a much worse and a much wetter problem uh, because I've applied insufficient <laughs> wisdom or knowledge to the problem. But what's the kind of wisdom we need, the, pro- the wisdom that, that works, that doesn't disappoint? And we see that in God's word, right? In Proverbs, one of my favorite passages is from chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. I could say that verse every day because I need to be reminded of that. That's what true wisdom is. Also in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So giving fear, in other words, reverence to God, his authority, submitting to him, that's where you'll find true wisdom and knowledge. Is that the kind of wisdom you're applying to your life? And that's our question when it comes to wisdom. Now, when it comes to the other topics that this woman brings up, godliness, mercy, right? She she really kind of lays some of that on thick makes several references to God, and to, uh, she seems to appear pious and appeal to David's uh, piety, but then again, the question is, why is she doing this? And is it really God's idea of godliness? She talks about God's mercy, right? His desire to bring back the banished one. And as we saw, that is at the heart of God. But in that same passage in Exodus chapter 34, the very next words are, that God is also one who will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. And in chapter 20 of Exodus, it concludes that by saying, of those who hate me. Uh, So in other words, as long as a person spurns the Lord, right, continues to hate him, refuses to turn back to him, then it's hard to experience that mercy, right? There's two sides to that coin of God's righteousness. He longs to extend mercy, but he's righteous and he's just. And will we turn to him and receive his mercy? Or will we be hardened and fight against him? So do you give, I'm not saying don't extend mercy to somebody who is, looks like they're not willing to accept it, but from a godly point of view, this kind of mercy can, end up being what we might call greasy grace. You've heard that term. That idea of offering forgiveness but seeing no repentance and seeing no transformation. So she's suggesting to King David to, uh, you know, what looks like religious sentiment, but it may be a human idea of forgiveness and not God's idea. It's it's a tricky question here. What I'm trying to say is, you know, what do we expect uh, from, for ourselves? Do we want God to accept us and meanwhile refuse to make changes to our worldview and to our behavior? Is that really forgiveness and mercy uh, in its fullness? What kind of forgiveness and mercy do we offer to others? Do we say, just go on doing what you're doing, it'll be okay? Okay. And again, that might look good for a while. It looks good. It's, a, it's nice, but there's a big mess waiting to happen. 
But God's grace, here's God's grace, <laughs> God's mercy. It's that we deserve to be cut off because of our sin. We read that in Isaiah 59, right? And yet God provides us a way to come back to him. And that is true then of the woman's statement. God does find a way to bring the banished one back. And the way is that God provides the way. Not our own way, right? That God has provided a way. And what is our job in that? It's to come to the Lord. It's to not rely upon our own way, but to turn to him, to receive his grace, to trust in his salvation. So, I, you know, just it takes some caution and discernment to ask, are we substituting our idea of, of a, a grace uh, and of wisdom for what God wants to give us in his wisdom and his grace. And it's found in his word. And so I think we have to hold true to his word and not just say, well, I think this is, you know, what I would do in this situation. It's what the woman of Tekoa said. Sounds good to me. What does God want us to do in this situation? Now, the second movement or the second act, again, deals now not so much with the woman and her wisdom, but reconciliation between David and Absalom. So does Joab's scheme pay off, right? This whole big effort. Well, starting in verse 21, it looks like it does a little bit here. Then the king said to Joab, so now he's not talking to the woman anymore, he's going straight to Joab. Behold now, I will surely do this thing. Go therefore, bring back the young man Absalom. And it's interesting, he calls him a young man. The Hebrew word is na'ar, which means a lad. So, you know, Absalom by now, he's no little kid. But to David, he'll always be his lad. And Joab, in response to this, like the woman before him, enters the king's presence and bows down with his face to the floor, just grateful that David would see things the way he wanted to see them, right? That he chose this course of action. So he goes to get Absalom. He brings him back. Looks like things are going the right way. But David suddenly changes his mind, right? By the time they get back, he says, you know what? He can come to Jerusalem, but he cannot see my face. Keep him in his house. So, again, it's not exactly a full restoration. It's partial. It's not complete. No visits to your father. Instead, he's kind of quarantined. He's confined to his own house. He's so close and yet so far. Now, we're given a little sidetrack here at this point. Uh, we're told about Absalom in all his glory starting in verse 25. Now in all Israel, there was no one as handsome as Absalom, so highly praised. So Absalom kind of like, da-da, steps out and pushes his way to the front of the stage. Hey everybody, look at me. And I think that's kind of what he does for the rest of his time in the book. And so we're focused on him and on his beauty. I have a slide here of Absalom and all his glory. Let's see if I can pull that up. Uh, well, I mean, it was by the French artist Tissot. He, was, he did a lot of paintings of scenes from the Bible, and uh, I think he tried to get the whole Absalom in here just to show how beautiful the soles of his feet are. Uh, but I'm sure Absalom looked much more glorious than this. He was, he was like Mr. Israel. Every year he won the, the beauty contest. And uh, every year he would, his hair grew so big and luxurious that he had this public sign of show off, right? Of like, let me cut my hair and just, oh, look how much it weighs, everybody. Isn't it awesome? And, uh, you know, every, he's kind of the picture of, of vanity, right? Uh, that he's so beautiful and he wants everybody to know about it. And so now we know about it. He's self-aware. That's important because in the next few chapters, we'll be reminded of, of his vanity. Other people will play on it as well. Uh, it's interesting uh, that we're specifically told about this long, luxurious hair that he would cut every year, which in the end, as you know, if you've read the rest of the book of 2 Samuel, spoiler, <laughs> is that he dies because of his hair. It's what causes his death. Uh, the, the Mishnah, the, the, the Jewish uh, writings in the Mishnah say that Absalom gloried in his hair, therefore he was hanged by it. Uh, so in the books of First and Second Samuel, see a, a lot of that idea of you reap what you sow. Uh, and so this is literally the thing that will be his downfall. We're also told of his children. It says that he had three sons in verse 27 and one daughter whose name was Tamar. 
She was a woman of beautiful appearance. It's interesting because also if you look to the end of the story in chapter 18, uh, Absalom says he doesn't have any sons to preserve his name. So is there a conflict here? I don't know. We'll get to that in a few weeks and try to figure that out. But the main focus here isn't so much on his sons who don't receive names in this part, but his beautiful daughter who is given the same name as his beautiful sister, Tamar. Uh, so this is quite the beautiful family. But I think another takeaway from this sidebar, hey, let's look at Absalom here, is to, to prepare us for the kind of person he is. Because what's going to happen in the next chapter is he wants to be the leader of Israel. But this is the kind of leader we already see that he is, right? Sort of um, all style, but no substance. Very beautiful. But uh, like Saul, remember King Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. What a guy. But does he have wisdom? Does he seek the Lord? Does he have faith in God? You know, those could be good questions for all of us as we look to leaders. And I'm so glad that when you called me here as a pastor, you weren't looking at beauty. You, uh, for what, <laughs> and uh, so I don't have to be worried about that. But, um, but how do we define success? Who do we look at as successful? What are we looking for in ourselves to be seen uh, as those qualities? Hopefully it's not just your beauty. You're all beautiful, but, but don't let that, you know, distract you. But now that our eyes have been focused on Absalom, let's, let's look at his predicament in the rest of the chapter, verses 28 to 33. He lived two full years in Jerusalem without being brought before the king. Remember how in the last chapter we looked at the, the echoes, the, the reflection stories of how those events seem to reflect Joseph and his time in Egypt. Well, this seems to reflect a bit of that as well. It calls up the idea that Joseph was in jail for two full years before he was brought before the king. Although I think the similarities kind of end there uh, because of the kind of uh, situation that Absalom is in. But he's two years, and add up all the time so far, after uh, the rape of his sister, he spent two years planning, and then he killed Amnon. That's two years. Then he spent three years in exile after he killed his brother. And then he came back to Jerusalem and spent two more years without seeing the king. So now it's been about seven years since all this started. Uh, mathematicians, correct me if I made any mistakes there. Uh, but at this point, he's like, this can't go on. Uh, David won't see me and Joab won't even see me. Maybe, jo maybe David gave orders. Nobody talks to Absalom. He's kind of under a house arrest, right? Like a solitary confinement. He's not banished from the country anymore, but he's banished from his father's presence. Uh, so what is he going to do? Some, this is, you know, he's got to do something, and he's going to do whatever he can get done. You know, David's sons are like that, that um, once they decide they want to get something, they get it. I wonder where they got that from. <laughs> Maybe from their father, David. But he calls to Joab, and Joab doesn't reply twice. So the third time's the charm. What does he do? He sends out his servants to burn down one of uh, Joab's field. And finally, Joab comes to him and complains, hey, what's the deal? And I love in chapter, uh, verse 32, because Absalom's kind of like, oh, now you want to talk. Uh, well, he's like this spoiled son of the king. He's not even afraid of Joab to burn his field. But he's like, now that you're here, let me tell you why I called you. It's so that you'll go to David and present my case, right? Why should I even be in Jerusalem if I can't see my father, can't see the king? I can't be part of his household. Remember Mephibosheth, the grandson of Saul, Jonathan's son, was eating at the king's table every day. And this is my, the son of the king, and I can't even enter the household. So he says, let me see my father. And he kind of uses David's own medicine, because when David was banished from King Saul, he said to Jonathan, if there's iniquity in me, then put me to death, right? So he uses some of that same language to say, look, if I've done anything wrong, ironically, he has done something wrong, right? He's kind of audacious because, you know, you murdered your brother. Uh, you're not exactly innocent, although I'm sure Absalom thinks it was justified, right? Look what he did, and look what you didn't do. So finally, verse 33, Joab comes to the king. The king calls for Absalom. Thus he came to the king and again, prostrated himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. 
So we see in that last verse all the right motions. It looks like a reconciliation, but is it truly restoration? Notice what we don't see in the, that one verse. We see a lot of motions and we see the right, you know, um, actions, but we don't hear anything about repentance or humility. Absalom isn't uh, weeping uh, and, and confessing. And also we don't hear any words from David of compassion. You know, when, when Joseph and the brothers reconciled, they said, we're guilty. And he said, God is so good. He's, he's brought all this to pass. And here it's just silence. No words at all. The long-awaited goal of, Absal- of, of Joab seems to have finally come, but it's superficial. It's just appearances. And there seems to be no real healing going on. So we're left at the end with, again, a form of reconciliation, but there's some tension. Again, as we look back at the, the picture of Rem, that Rembrandt did, here's another drawing he did of, of Absalom bowing at the feet of King David. Um, it's a little hard to make out if you, if you could see it. Um, King David is in all his royal robes, sort of impassively just looking down from his throne like, hmm, you're back, and, and, and there is Absalom bowing down low to the ground. But in the painting we looked at before, there's an embrace, right? This is the moment where he takes him in his arms. But still the question is, has he fully embraced him? As you zoom in a little bit, uh, you know, you're not, the, the king's face still looks a little ambivalent. It looks as though Absalom is, is weeping in this painting. And again, I would guess this is Absalom. Look at his beautiful long hair and his glorious robes. Um, but it's sort of an un, uh, uh, you know, uncertain kind of embrace. There's so much more I want to talk about in this chapter. <laughs> because of the parallels, um, I think I just have to fly by really quick, and if you want to talk to me later, I can show you what those are. But this not only echoes back to Joseph in the book of Genesis, but really chapters 13 and 14 are like a parallel to chapters 11 and 12 of Second Samuel. Because what did we see there? We saw David who committed sexual sin with Bathsheba and then murdered Uriah. And what did we see in chapter 13? Amnon who committed that sin against Tamar. Now there's a murder that happens as a result but it's Absalom who murders Amnon but there's this uh, there's this rape that leads to murder parallel. Chapter 12, what happens? Well, God confronts David through the prophet Nathan, right? God sends Nathan to David to confront him and to convict him. And there's an outcome to that. David repents. And a son is given. Solomon is born in the end. And there's, there's this sort of conclusion of peace. But in chapter 14, who is sending whom? Well, God isn't in the picture so much, but it's Joab who's doing the sending. He sends the woman from Tekoa to David to confront, to, if not convict, at least persuade. And then there's a result. What is it? It's this reunion, it's the son which is restored, but is it true reconciliation or is there a tension here? Of course, the glaring difference between those parallels is that Joab is certainly not God, right? So this is a, what are his motives uh, and why has he brought this to pass? And again, there seems to be an appearance of these, these elements of wisdom, of mercy, of reconciliation, but in the end, things are still broken. And things are still festering. So as far as our question, which, you know, we asked at the first half of the message, is this really true wisdom? We might ask now, is this really true reconciliation? Or if it isn't, what is, right? What is God's idea of reconciliation? Um, It's hard to look at that painting and not also think of, of Rembrandt's prodigal son. There we don't see a man with the rich, you know, silk robes on. We see a, a man who's, who's, who's wearing rags, right, who comes back to his father. That's maybe the kind of reconciliation that we want to see. How can we be restored in that way, right? How can everything be not just kind of brought back to a status quo, but made new and made right? And I love the words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. We've read them recently, and I'd like to read them again. Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah... He is a new creature. 
The old things passed away. Behold, behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God. In other words, not from ourselves, right? But from God, who reconciled us to himself through the Messiah and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Messiah reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Boy, that God really does have a heart to reconcile the lost, to bring back the one who is banished. And how is it? It's that he provided his son, Yeshua, to pay the price that separated us from God so that we could be reconciled. It's a bit of what we saw in chapter 12, right? When David not only came before the Lord, but he repented. He said, I have sinned. And God drew him into his arms. I think it's what God wants to do in your life as well and in my life. It's what God wants to do through you, right? Into the lives of those who might be estranged, not only from you, but those who might be estranged from God. Uh, A couple verses down in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, be reconciled to God, you know? Like, what do I got to do? Knock your head together? Just to, can you please be reconciled to God? God has done what is necessary for you to be reconciled to him. Again, we've, we've seen those passages before, but they bear repeating week after week. And today, as we prepare to uh, remember the Lord and what he did for us to reconcile us to himself in Nizkor, what a time for us to remember those words, to remember what the Lord did. Because, again, our own efforts to bring reconciliation are insufficient and they'll probably lead to bigger problems. But God has done what only God can do, what only the power of the gospel can do 